Welcome to the NAPB Education Podcast. Hello, fellow cultivators of curiosity. I'm Clayton Carley. And I'm Lance Merrick. And today we will guide you through the captivating universe where seeds, genes, and everything in between converge. Whether you're out in the field orchestrating a symphony of pollen in the nursery or decoding the secrets of genetics in the lab, you've just stepped into the epicenter of scientific discovery. In today's episode, we have Dr. David Bubeck from Corteva AgriScience to talk about the history of biotech and breeding. So buckle up and join us as we cultivate some captivating conversations. So to kick this off, Dave, I'd like you to introduce yourself to the audience. Well, hi, guys. Thanks. Uh, thanks much for having me. And thanks for doing these podcasts. I yeah. think it's awesome to get, you know, the stories of people working in the in the field of plant breeding and plant sciences out there and and get their stories told. So thanks for thanks for doing this in the, in, at the beginning here. And uh, so I, I grew up on a farm in north central Iowa. Um, crop and livestock farm, very diverse farm in, in the 60s and 70s, and watched watched a lot of the diversity fall out of central Corn Belt agriculture um, through the 1970s and early 1980s. And I, I ended up going to uh, graduate school, well, first got my undergrad degree in agronomy at Iowa State, and then went into, uh, started working for the Soybean Breeding Project, uh, Walt Fair in the summer, mm-hmm. um, as a research assistant, an undergrad research assistant, and I just fell in love with with plant breeding and genetics. Uh, I was already really intrigued on the plant science side, but uh, but I found my home fairly quickly in plant breeding. So I stayed there, got a uh, master's degree in soybean breeding and cited genetics, and then went on to North Carolina State and got my PhD in in uh, corn breeding. And uh, then I, I ended up uh, as a corn breeder for Northrop King Company, um, which was a Sando, a division of Sandos, um, and then went through the merger that formed Abartis, and then eventually came to Pioneer Hybrid in 1998, where I was a corn breeder for seven years, and then managed the different parts of the North America Corn Breeding Organization and also Southern Europe. And now, now I do a plethora of of things related to plant breeding, but not directly plant breeding. Uh, I work and support our our germplasm security group. So all the plant variety protection and patenting of our germplasm. And and then I do a lot of things around uh, compliance and stewardship and and the regulatory aspects of our of our products that we develop on the seed side. So that's where it's kind of what I'm doing today. Yeah. That's a that's a very long and impressive career, Dave. I want to thank you again for joining us. Um, with such a long career, um, it's always interesting to find how people really got into plant breeding, right? Because it, it is a very specific niche in agriculture, something you, you might not even hear about growing up, really, for the most part. Um, so I'd just like to get your take on what, what really fueled your passion for plant breeding, and how did you really get into it? Yeah. So I, I, I think it started very early in in my life growing up on the farm where I really had a passion for growing plants. Um, we, uh, you know, we spent our summers as kids on the farm walking soybeans and, and managing weeds. And uh, the weed control was was a really negative aspect of that. And, uh, and you know, didn't have the the creative thought to say there's a, there's a better way to control these weeds besides a hoe. Um, but certainly it wasn't that many years into the future when that was actually gonna gonna be happen through roundup ready crops, roundup ready resistant crops. But but anyway, it was, you know, grow, growing plants was a lot more intriguing to me than animals. I explored animal science a little bit, but uh corn plants and soybean plants didn't talk back, but hogs seemed to talk back. So or bite back. part of the life I have more bite back. <laughs> Uh, hogs were part of the livestock that we had, as, as well as uh, cattle. We had a cow calf herd as well when I black Angus when I was a kid. Um, but I was really more intrigued by the plant side. Um, interestingly, I grew I grew my first garden. It wasn't part of the family garden. I wanted it to go to a different spot than the normal rotational spots of the family garden. So. I thought it would be nice to grow it in an, in an old cattle pasture that should be fertile from you know a lot of organics mm-hmm. and manure and um, and I and I grew it next to the side of a, a concrete uh, a large concrete area that had runoff so I thought I'd have plenty of moisture. Well, it, 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 and I was I was probably twelve years old or something and and so went out there with my seeds planted it all 
it was it was an absolute disaster of between the rain that runoff that made it wet, which meant I could never hoe weeds in the garden. It, it got out of control relatively quickly. But anyway, my first experience with running a, an operation myself wasn't a very good one. So, but 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 I wasn't uh, undaunted by the the uh, excitement of growing uh, of growing plants and and the plant science behind it was probably birthed in some of that experience early on. That that's pretty awesome. I, I think you you kind of hit the the question there of the day where. You know, back in the day, you had to hoe a lot of soybeans. I mean, can you tell me a little bit more about what that experience was like? I mean, talk to the generation that's probably never had to actually go hoe in 80. Right? Yeah. What's that like now? It, it's it's facing an, a, a hill so high, you don't know how you're ever going <laughs> to. Like, how do you ever complete this staring across? And at flat north central Iowa, you can see to the other end of the field. Yeah. And you can see across half mile acre rows. Yeah. And, and you take depending on the, the volume of the weeds, uh, you're taking two rows or okay. maybe four rows if the weed pressure isn't that high. Um, but but let me back up before that. So there, there were, of course, pre-plant, pre-emergent herbicides that you used. Okay. Broad leaves, and, and that took care of grasses generally well. So oh, you, weren't, so you, weren't, you weren't hoeing grasses, yeah. you were hoeing broad leaves. It was, the broadleaf problem that how do you control broadleaves in a broadleaf crop? Yeah. It was like impossible of the day. So my my dad had a what what was a, every everybody had some kind of a row crop cultivator okay. to take care of the bulk of the volume of the weeds. Because otherwise it would have been a total carpet. Oh. So so my dad was a believer in what was called a a, a rolling cultivator, and it was a, a lily lily uh Lilliston. That was the was the odd brand name. And it had these rolling tillers, basically, where you could throw dirt towards the row. Huh. And it, if you could get in there when the weeds were small, mm -hmm. you you could control 99% of the weed population. It was amazing when it worked. Okay. The problem was if you if you missed when the weeds were like two leaf stage, mm -hmm. tiny little broad leaves. You, you missed your window of opportunity for that cultivator to really work. And that's where the solid tooth cultivators as a backup, mm. those, those were highly critical yeah. to the operation. So everybody depended on row crop cultivation to knock down the wheat population. And, and what was left was left for the guys walking beans with a hoe. Yeah. And so we'd, we'd go out there, you know, we, I was, the youngest of four. And, and so I, re, I remember doing this from the time I was seven, eight years old. I mean, you go out there pretty early in life and, and that's how most of your teenage years were eventually spent. And that, and that became in the worst of years, that became a good chunk of your, your June and July. Yeah. Till, till you got to a real good canopy on the soybeans and you, you started controlling the weeds from the canopy. How much of that was dad saying like, hey, you go do this or do you wrangle up high schooler friends? Like what was, how much of it was you versus yeah. if you got other friends to help out? For us, it was almost entirely a family affair. Okay. Right? And and my dad was out there too. Yeah. So, and the, he was a believer in a sharp hoe. So okay. he had a, he had a hand file with him and he wow. took the, you know, he, he sharpened the hoe basically on every couple of rounds of walking beans. You probably burn through a hoe every two, three fields then, I eh? think. You know, I, so I still, I still have my favorite hoe from the farm, believe Whoa. it or not, that yeah. I use in my garden. It's an old hoe <laughs> with the hardest crazy steel. You can't buy steel like that oh, today. That you, you could just shave your beard with it. So That's awesome. It's crazy sharp. It's amazing. So you, you talking through like hoeing this, like, tell me about this journey that you've got to experience from a lifetime of literally walking 80s of soybeans into like the advent of genetics and technologies and tools that totally revolutionized that. Like I can only imagine that's been quite an adventure to see, right? Like my grandpa going from still shelling corn by hand to now combines that can clear a whole field in a couple hours. Uh, what was that advent like for you going from hoe to biotechnology? What was that whole story? Like you've seen this evolve in real time. Well, and, and it actually, you know, from the time of growing up in the se late 70s and, and up to 1980, you know, it, it emerged pretty quickly. So that period between 1980 and, and 90 was was kind of a blur because okay. we spent in, in undergrad and and uh, graduate school. Um, 
you know, when I guess when I first really started to zero in as, 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 as on biotechnology as a potential solution to some of these issues, you know, I remember from the time I was going from my master's degree at Iowa State to my PhD, I got invited to give a talk at a at a crop science annual meeting, crop science agronomy and, and soils. And I, I had no idea. I mean, I knew it was a big deal. Like, how did I get this invitation to speak as a grad student? So they, they were doing this special session, a symposium at, within the context of the annual meeting on the future education of plant breeders. Oh. And they asked two grad students, Lori Marshall from the University of Minnesota. I have I lost track of her. I don't know where Lori is huh. today. And myself, and I was in transition between Iowa State. I already got into North Carolina State and Raleigh. And the meetings that year were in Atlanta, Georgia. And <clears throat> I didn't know, like, what I, I'm in between my master's and PhD. I don't know what to say really about the future education of of plant breeders. And so I decided to get, to uh, do a survey of my fellow graduate students. And I wow. came up with a set of, I don't know, 15 or 20 questions. And, and I had no idea at the time that they had plans to publish the talks in the in the Agronomic Journal of Education. Okay. okay. And so I, I, I didn't know, like, I didn't have a lot of ideas on what I was gonna say at this, but I wanted to center it around biotechnology as kind of the core to the future of how I thought plant breeders were going to need to be educated. So mm -hmm. molecular biology was a big deal. And, and at that time, there was a big separation between people that were studying field plant breeding and people that were studying molecular biology. Okay. There, was, there was a huge gap. You didn't do both. You did one or the other. And so one of the questions that I asked the the my fellow plant breeding students, not molecular breeding, not molecular biology students, but plant breeding students, I said, when do you think the first products of biotechnology will be commercialized in seeds? Mm. And, and I gave a multiple choice answer. One, one I think was it already has. They are, they're already <laughs> commercialized. Yeah. Or I think that the next answer was this, again, this was 1987. Um, and I, so I said now, or the year 2000, the year 2010, or never. Mm. Some students said never. I have no idea where those people are today. I, I hope they have jobs. <laughs> yeah. The the majority, and I, I looked it up because I couldn't remember for sure, 89% of the students that responded, and there was about 170 students that responded, 89% of them said the year 2000. <clears throat> and I, and I, by the way, I define biotechnology too as um, the the use of recombinant DNA to for transgenics. So okay. I was really defining GMOs when I asked the yeah. question. And and lo and behold, I mean the first the first GMOs were commercialized in soybeans and corn in 1995 and 1996 for corn. Yeah. So the students had it right. I mean they had a pretty good pulse on what was going on. Little did any of us know about product development timelines in the industry, the yeah, private sector. I mean, nobody, the nobody knew the behind the scenes. What's what? Nobody knew anything about the regulatory path. Is there a there, there's not a global, there's path. no global regulated framework at this point. Yeah. The, the framework even in the US was just being formulated. It's the wild west of biotechnology still. Exactly. So, so anyway, students were amazingly correct on it. Um, so anyway, I, at the, the me annual meetings, I talked about the results of the survey. That was just one of the questions, but it was <clears throat> that was an interesting way to go. So biotech, I think um, the, the, the other thing to point out in the early part of the journey is nobody that was in the midst of the science and development of biotechnology or GMO traits had any idea that the the social resistance and the and the anti-GMO sentiment mm -hmm. sentiments that would come. M most of us thought the world really wouldn't care. Yeah, you know, consumers never had a thought about the safety of where their food came from. There was there was never any um, pushback evident in the early days. And so the the whole private sector, as well as the science community, I would say among the academics were totally naive about the the pressures that would eventually come in the in the anti-GMO sentiments yeah. that to some extent remain with us today. Yeah. 
Cool, and I think that's such an interesting perspective because growing up on the flip side of that coin, right? While you're developing it, I'm going through high school and college in this anti-GMO sentiment. And everything in Agia that we're trying to do is like, oh, help explain the biology, help explain what's going on. Where does your food come from? So what was that transition like from, all right, we're doing basic science, basic biology to create these genetically modified organisms, these transgenes and saying, now we have to do just as much marketing about these to the whole public as we did with just the growers who are producing it. Yeah, I I think that awakening among the science community was was very, very slow. Mm. So I I can tell you, I was, uh, you know, fast forward a few years now to the the late 1990s, and I was walking um, BT corn trials in, in Italy and Spain. Okay. And we had regulatory permits. There, there was, by that point in time, there was a framework such that you could you could apply for field permits and get field permits by country. Not in every country, but in many in many countries, this was a possible path. <clears throat> and I remember in in 19, I believe it was 1999, and th and there's tremendous amount of European corn borer pressure and sesamia pressure, a couple of adopter and pests that that were the targets of Bacillus thuringiensis and Bt corn, and 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 the pressure in southern Europe was tremendous, mm -hmm. and and yield losses of you know twenty to forty percent wow. were very common due to due to lepidopter and insect pressure. And we we were doing our corn tour in September, and we walked into these regulated plots, and clearly an, an obvious advantage of the BTs beyond what most of us coming coming from the root of plant breeding. Beyond what most of us would have predicted, yeah. you, know, you know, we never really knew how much corn borers were causing the grain yield loss until we could actually have a control and test it. Well, and you're skipping, and a, in theory, millennia of generations right, right. to get to it. Right. And so now you actually had a measure of the actual grain yield loss that was occurring. And and so it was so far, far beyond what most people, most of us in the breeding world were predicting. And and I remember conversations in the field like we we had some of the government officials in Italy in particular were coming uh, two weeks after we were done with our corn tour and they were going to be there for the local team to uh, to host the tour and the conversations we had were like once they see the results of this work it, it's going to be quickly accepted and adopted yeah the the naivety among Everybody in the industry the, of the uphill battle that we faced, um, we, we had no idea. And that was the general consensus. Was it really like a too much too fast? This is too much change. Like, what are you doing to it? Like, what what created that pushback out of the gate, do you think? Yeah, I, I think when we saw visually the benefits of it, they saw the dangers of it and, yeah. and the lack of understanding of even at the time the the amount of safety um huh. testing that was yeah. that was being done from a, a standpoint of both protein digestibility which is important in the mammalian gut mm -hmm. you know our guts um the the risk of toxicities um because it was a toxic effect upon the insects that was a very specific interaction between the the insect and the the protein and um and 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 the long term the long term health effects <clears throat> were a concern at the time, and they didn't. I, I think the uh, the people that were anti GMO really didn't believe that adequate testing from a safety perspective was being put in place. When mm -hmm. in fact it was quite extensive. Yeah, and still is to this day, and right? Very much to this day. Yeah, and issues <laughs> around digestibility. Um, uh, toxicity, even carcinogenic effects of genes are so much better known today and predictable than what they were 30 years ago. Yeah. And, and still, you know, the safety regulations are are firmly in place to establish the safety of any genes that we're doing in testing. Yeah. So do you think um, a lot of the communication failed between the public and the scientists creating it due to just the transparency of all the things that go on in the background. You know, I know working with uh, biotech crops in my current role and stuff, 
you know, there's a lot of safeguards that the USDA puts into place and so on that, you know, there's so many different steps that go on and something that the public may not even know about or be aware of and uh, of how much actually goes on in the background to ensure that these crops are safe and everything we do goes through a very vetted process before anything gets released, right? I mean, it takes, what, 17 to 20 years to release a new biotech trait. And through that entire time, right, there's a lot of safeguards put in place. Exactly. Yeah. And I, and I think going through that experience as an industry and as a, as a science field, you know, there's a better appreciation today of the transparency that's needed, mm -hmm. uh, not not only with the policy agencies and, you know, it, and uh, the data collection that's done as we go through the <clears throat> the product testing and product concepts and testing that's done, but but also with with the consumers and food companies, um, the grain trade. Yeah. And and there's a lot more ongoing transparency that occurs. Um, social media opportunities to communicate. <clears throat> I think there's there's just a lot more effort, but it took a long time for those efforts to be initiated. So so there was little to nothing that was done before 2000. And and even in the early 2000s there was there was very little appreciation for why we needed to connect and you know you watch you watch the world around us and consumers have have gotten a lot more in tune with where their food comes from. Mm -hmm. Local food supply is of great interest and enthusiasm to the consumer. Um being able to understand where their food comes from is just a more central issue today than it's ever been before. Yeah, and and so we have to we we have an obligation as a as an industry to step up to the, you know, that opportunity to communicate and, and also appreciate that sometimes even facts of science are not necessarily going to change people's minds. Mm, yeah, well, I think that's why it's so critical to try and communicate the facts with the story too helping understand where those are coming from, why the scientists care so much about what they're working on. I mean, these are real people too, right? Yeah, you're a right. person sitting with us. You've been working on this for quite some time. But I would like to imagine you're not gonna help push anything through that would harm you or your family as well, right? That's <laughs> exactly. Or the or the environment either. Right. I mean, you know, those of those of us in the plant breeding field and for the listeners here, you know, you know that you enjoy the outdoors. And <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Many of us went into this business because we we love we we love the environment. We love the outdoors. We love working with plants directly and with biology. And so we we of all people want to be good stewards of what we're doing in the environment. And you know, and I and I think in many ways the technologies that we're developing, you know, from a producer's benefit standpoint, do benefit the environment as well. Mm. Uh, and and so. You know, we're we're all striving for hopefully the same positive outcomes. Yeah. And and I and I think the other thing on technology and biotechnology development is we need to do a better job of delivering traits and nutritional benefits that will ultimately benefit the consumer and be appreciated by society. Um, many of those early targets were to benefit the producer and the grower yeah. and didn't have a lot of direct benefits to the consumer. Almost exclusively. For yeah. The yeah. Right. So with that, would you think, you know, as Planish comes out and and so some of those more, you know, consumer oriented traits and some of our biotech, do you think those things will help? The public understand a little bit more because then it's not orientated towards um, helping just the the plants and the producers themselves, but more of the general public. Yeah, I think that's right, and and um, you know I, I I think it's very unfortunate that the regulatory path towards use of GMOs, you know there there have been some estimates of in the past $100 million from gene discovery all the way to commercialization of the cost of developing one new GMO trait. Um, more recent estimates have been as high as $150 million. I, I, I personally think it's even actually in reality higher than that. Mm -hmm. To truly go from, <clears throat> excuse me, from gene discovery all the way through all the product development testing 
demonstrating the efficacy of whatever the trait target might be, and, the, and then getting all the way to commercialization, all the cost of the R&D of the product, of the sheer product development, plus the cost of regulatory pathway. And, and then if you're trying to globalize it to any extent where you're talking about multiple countries, I, I think it's upwards of $200 million. But th these are kind of my rough estimates, knowing what R&D costs are and what, what deregulation costs can be. So, so to do that in an underdeveloped crop species mm -hmm. like okra or, you know, or lentils, yeah. let's just pick on a couple of examples. Very little research effort has been put into those. And you're not, you're not talking a lot of acres that are ever going to be impacted. Nobody can invest $200 million yeah. in that. So, so the system is ineffective. To, to be able to, to leverage these technologies in, in lesser developed crops that yeah. don't have the opportunity. What we do not want to have the same outcome with genome editing. And, and I, th I think we have great opportunity to demonstrate the benefits in gen of genome editing where, you know, and, and difference between genome editing versus GMOs is you're, you're truly working in genome editing in a, in a completely cisgenic fashion so you're 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 driving into a into a native genome <clears throat> and you're making edits precisely in that native genome and so you know foreign genes are not involved in in the outcome of the product yeah and so i think i think there we we need to be very careful whether in the us or anywhere in the world that we do a better job of getting alignment globally of the regulatory path. Mm. And hopefully it will be a very light path in most cases, because again, they, they won't be able to afford to really have it impact many, many species in vegetables, fruits, nuts. Yeah. Um, you, you have to get on a path that is a, is a smooth course that's not gonna cost $200 million. Yeah. Well, and I think you're, Throwing around terms here like cisgene, transgene, and I want to back up a second and think back to when I was a, a grade schooler, high schooler, uh, sitting in our farm office, and the first time a sales rep came in and said, "Hey, we've got this VT triple trait that we're offering this year for the first time." And I remember sitting there and like the the sales rep was explaining the genetics and the first time stacking all of these genes together, and just thinking like, "Wow, that is so cool!" Like it was like help spurring my desire and passion to get into breeding and genetics. But in the background, you're actively working on all of these traits, right? You've been working on these types of traits for 10 years before I'd even heard of it. So can you walk us through these steps of what it was like when you first came out of grad school for biotechnology to today, where now we're working with cisgenes, transgenes, genome editing, like what were the steps in between where we are today to get us here? And then maybe we can deep dive on editing and where we might see it going. Yeah. So, so I'll spend most of the, let me, let me focus entirely actually on corn. Okay. And because that's where I spent the majority of my career in it. And so here, here we are in 2023. The first corn trait was commercialized in 1996. And, and there have been, so there have been 21 transgenic events that have been commercialized in corn. I think by number, I might have missed one, but that's close, plus or minus one. Um, and, and the majority, Almost all of those traits have been towards insect resistance and herbicide resistance. Um, there, there have been a couple of quality related traits and, and, a, and a drop target trait that's out there, um, but most of them have been on controlling insects. And, and, and that's across the whole industry, right? Across the entire industry. This is not just Corteva, it's across the entire industry of corn research efforts on, on, on GMO traits. Um, each one of those, I, you know, so I'm going to, I'm going to tell a quick story of when I, when I started, my, my job was about 70% breeding program and about 30% technology. Okay. The technology piece included helping with the GMO pipeline, which then was entirely, um, for us, it was entirely, uh, insect resistance and a little bit of herbicide. And, and then the other part was markers. I haven't talked at all about yeah. molecular markers. We should touch on that here somewhere along the, the journey. 
Um, but but in terms of the the BT traits, um, I was asked in the first six months, could you uh, of my my breeding job, could you lay out or we need you to lay out the timeline of the of the breeding effort that will take to to do trade integration mm -hmm. of and back crossing basically back crossing system um, for we didn't even have the lead event yet. Okay. You want to explain uh, what that is? And, and so, so in transgenic events, um, you 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 have a gene, you have a target gene, you put it into a, a vector, a genetic construct, a construct of multiple you know segments of DNA, um, regulatory elements together with the functional gene that creates the protein, and and so you you knew you had to start out with some number of events. In the day, people didn't know, is is 10 enough? Is 100? Do we need 1,000? Well, we couldn't create 1,000 because we didn't have the, you know, it, it wasn't possible to create that many by the technology that was available. And each event is its own unique genetic construct. Though. Yep, yeah. and, and each event is expressing maybe a little different level of protein. Where, it, where that gene through random transformation, either you were using agrobacterium or as a transformation system, or you needed a way to, to get the foreign gene inserted into the native genome. And so you, you could have been using agrobacterium, you could have been using the gene gun, <laughs> uh, which was literally shooting it, the, well, the, the foreign heard, genes into the cells. I've heard old stories of the, the creation of the gene gun, where he actually brought in a blank gun and literally fired it at the cells. Like, literally like, fired. An and actual it, revolver. <laughs> and my understanding was a wake up in the middle of the night moment where yeah. how am I going to get these genes into the into the native cells? Yeah. And so and you talk about the wild west of biotechnology, like we're literally guns blazing, the, shooting genes into cells, and you don't know where the targets are right now. Exactly. So so each one of these events was the genes were uniquely going into some random spot in the genome. Mm -hmm. Some of those places in the genome might have been disruptive. Like, what if what if they interrupted a native gene that was important to the performance of that plant? Yeah, and and so we were sorting through multiple events. So at the time that I was asked to draw up this timeline, we we didn't even have our lead, the lead uh, event identified. Yeah. And this this would have been 1991, and so I drew it up purely from a breeding standpoint. Ignoring, I didn't know anything about the regulatory pathway. Yeah. So I drew it up truly on the schematic of what kind of timeline would it take to breed it in to elite back elite genetics and the time that it would take to test at least a couple years yeah. of the final product that we, we would eventually sell. And so drew that up and and said, look, by 1996, we could release some commercial products. Yeah. Crazy, five years, what, three years of back crossing, getting it in, you know, using off season winter nurseries to get it back crossed into the plants. Choose a few genetic backgrounds that you would commercialize as a first step. Yeah. Probably. How long, how fast could we actually do this? Yeah. Three years of back crossing, two years of testing, and sell. Okay. First products. We we were ready with winter production at the commercial level. We were ready to sell in the summer of 1996. Wow. Regulatory held us up one year, and we sold in 1997. Okay. Okay. So so fast forward to today, and I've I've shared this story with our you know regulatory agency people in the USDA Biotech Research Service. You mean they only held you for one year? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I and I said, okay, you fast forward to 2023. I'm looking at products, put, put experimental things in the field now mm -hmm. that we're not going to commercialize for another 10 years. Yeah. So you know, in in many cases, it's so so every what has happened with the regulatory system is every good idea for a, a, an experiment that needed to be done was added to the regulatory process. And nothing, I shouldn't say nothing, very little has ever been removed. Yeah. So the length of the regulatory timelines and global regulatory timelines have just increased. So that's, that's, that's one thing that's happened. Um, 
really had, you know, through looking at competitor commercial products and internally what we've had research licenses to do, have had a, a wonderful opportunity to look at most of the traits that have been commercialized. And, you know, and, and it's been it's been a wonderful experience, but um, it, with every trait combination, you you really have to think about what what do our customers need in the products? They don't need all 21 events. Yep. They need some subset of those events targeted towards the, the insects and the management system that they're going to use on the farm that's most beneficial to them. Yeah. And so, it, interestingly, most of those 21 events are still on the market today. I think there's probably maybe five or six that are that have expired mm -hmm. for various reasons, but most of them are actually still being used somewhere in yeah. the world. So standing the test of selection against them. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned a little bit on um, talking through markers. Uh, if we were to think through the technology advancements, just purely how far the science has come, like walk us through the days of RFLPs mm -hmm. and bring us up to today with gene editing. Like what have been some of the stage gates advancements throughout the decades? Yeah, <clears throat> this is a, that, this so, could take a while. Walk down that lane, <laughs> right? Like what's the what's the high level <laughs> overview on it? Yeah, so let let me give you a, a little of my personal experience with with molecular markers. So started out at Iowa State as as uh, an undergrad and then did master's degree. I, I had a senior graduate student working next to me that was working on his PhD, and he, he was using isozymes and soybeans yeah. to track. So isozymes consider them kind of uh, uh, markers that can can mark a spot of location in the genome, but we don't really care about isozymes themselves. Mm. What we care about is in the genome, the genes of interest that they're linked to. Yeah. So, so isozymes were interesting, but the challenge was they didn't mark very many spots in the genome. So, you know, to, to fast forward to the year 2000 and the human genome was sequenced, well, you, instead of a sequence, you had a few random markers that were you know, randomly located across the genome and yeah. didn't really track the genome very well. And hopefully some of those markers <laughs> would be closely linked with traits of interest. And so isozymes were were cheap, relatively cheap, but they, they didn't give you a dense enough map. Mm -hmm. And so then the the next, so then I'm gonna just quickly walk through the 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 different eras of molecular markers that were developed. So then, then it was brought on in the in the days of they they had these things that were called restriction enzymes. Yeah. That that were specific to certain base pair sequences in the genome, and they would cut DNA at that certain point of, mm. of a sequence in the genome. And in this and, day, we still don't even know the whole because the corn genome wasn't built until 2009, right? Exactly. So you're still kind of shooting in the dark at where these enzymes are. Right. Nobody, nobody knew where these were, and and you could use you know standard genetic mapping exercises to map yeah. the, the genome with these markers, and so these endonucleases then would cut at different points. These enzymes would cut at different points in the genome, and that they would create different sized fragments. And those were called restriction fragment link polymorphisms, so hence RFLPs. So RFLPs were, they gave you a more dense map. Yeah. But in any particular breeding cross that you would want to make, you would still have these large gaps of, you know, so a centimorgan is one centimorgan is the, the percentage of 1% of, of recombination or crossovers that would occur in the genome. <clears throat> and you would you would have gaps of sometimes 20, 40, 50, 60 centimorgans, depending on where it was in the genome. So everybody was doing mapping and heavy mapping. And the, so in corn, this, this occurred with RFLPs really between about 1986 and the late 1990s. Okay. And so our RFLPs and there there were AFLPs, there were amplified fragment link polymorphisms, <coughs> and variations on that that occurred as well. Um, that got you a little higher throughput and cheaper, and and so there was some progress that was made in the 90s. Um, 
but but then with the advent of sequencing, um, there there were single stranded repeats that occurred, and that 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 kind of started in the late '90s and went well into the 2000s. Um, but but those still really didn't give you as dense a maps as what you would like, mm -hmm. and they were still pretty costly. So I think <clears throat> in the early 2000s, you know, you were still looking at a dollar a data point. Wow. So, you know, I, I think Pioneer got to cross about a million data points a year with SSRs in in 2003. Yeah. Um, but we still weren't both from a cost perspective and a, and a density resolution of, of a genomic map. We still weren't where we wanted to be. And so interestingly, the, the human genome was sequenced in 2000. Um, Solera with Craig Venter went around and said, we'd like to map your favorite genome for yeah. $70 million. $70 million. How yep. about that? That was shortly after the human genome was sequenced. And of course, the mouse genome was yep. sequenced. And, and down the line too. And, and we, we actually thought about that. And, and the issue for us in Pioneer Hybrid was we, we didn't want to map just sequence. We didn't want to sequence just a few individuals. We wanted to understand the broader genetic diversity behind all of our genetics, not yeah. just not just a few corn and bread lines. Yeah. Sure. And it's the pioneering days of the pan genome then. Exactly. Yeah. So we we were very interested in a much more dense map, but across the lots of individuals. Mm -hmm. And so then that brought on the age of, of SNPs single nu nucleotide polymorphisms and, and at least partial sequencing that we do today. It, it brought on an advent of more than a thousand fold of reduction in the cost of a, of a genotypic marker. Yeah. And it brought on the, the density of maps that we finally wanted to achieve. So, so that we could evolve to things like whole genome selection. Yeah. So, so back on the, to the tail end of the marker. So we got all the way up to you know the development of of SNP markers, and I and I think I I remember in the late '90s that people started talking about we're we're gene rich. Mm. You know we know all this information. We we can now track genes on chromosomes <clears throat> with the use of molecular markers, and and so we're going to manipulate genes and gene effects with, oh. within native genes. What a tale well, of you don't know what you don't know. Well, exactly. <laughs> And, and very, you know, a very low percentage of functional genes were actually known. Yeah. Uh, we know in, in many plant species that there's an infinitesimal number of infinitesimally small gene effects. And, and it's very difficult to actually um, uh, manipulate those effects to larger to larger gene effects. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the journey that we're on, whether it's through genome editing or some future technology that we haven't really called the name out of yet, um, we're going to we're going to get into a point where we living we're truly living in a post genomic world mm -hmm. where we're able to to leverage the genome with better resolution, better sophistication, perhaps turn genes of small effect, almost immeasurably small effect into genes of larger effect, yeah. whether that's genome editing or some technology we're not quite touching yet. Uh -huh. um, I think that's where it's going. And, and I'm confident that the two of you will, will actually truly see the, the moment where we're in a, in a post-genomic era where we don't, we don't just talk about the genome, but we're actually using the genome to change the genetic variation and the and the the genetic potential of plants. Yeah. Oh gosh. I, I dream of the day where we can we're leveraging the whole sections of the genome and just really under actually understanding what's going on. I mean, it's yeah. still a story of we don't know what we don't know inside that genome and all the epigenetic effects and everything that's underlying. Like we're still just touching the surface of the iceberg here. Oh, I can't wait to see where it goes. Absolutely. Dave, that is so cool of like the history of so much that you've seen in this genetic world and everything that you've been able to play to. So I guess as Lance and I are kind of starting off in our careers and both getting going here, from someone who's experienced a lot 
like what would be some things that you could boil down and suggest to new young plant breeders or folks in breeding adjacent positions to really start leveraging that post-genetic world or getting into this new era of plant breeding? Yeah, I I would say just be open-minded to what technologies can contribute. Mm. Um, I, I haven't talked at all about the, the engineering part of what we do, but the mechanics and engineering, um, the I, I believe that every trait that a plant breeder would be interesting in, interested in collecting, um, that our that our growers, our customers would be interested in having improved in their products. You know, all of these things can be taken in a more automated way. So whether that's you, know, we haven't talked about ground based, uh, ground based or aerial automation of data collection and digitization yeah. of the traits that we visualize. But I think that's that's a direction um, that we're we're already solidly on that's going to change how we think about data collection in yeah. the field in, in the field research context. So it sounds like we've been we've been going through the genetic improvements here. Now we're starting to move into a phenotypic renaissance then as well. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And and you know, we talked about the molecular marker journey. What what we have been so in more than a thousand fold decrease in the cost of a molecular marker data point, <clears throat> but we we really haven't reduced or or expanded <clears throat> the volume and numbers of what we can do in the field. Mm -hmm. So that that field phenotyping part and the combination of of predictions so that we can predict the performance of a plant without taking it to the field. Yeah, I think those those are the components that are all going to have to be synthesized and brought together into a, a very contiguous and, and, and comprehensive approach to how we improve crop performance. Um, so I think I think that's all coming where artificial intelligence fits into all of that in, in helping us predict and yeah. select and go through a decision process. I think that's that's a question that's out there for all of us. We know it's we know it's coming and it's going to hit us in some way. Yeah. How do we leverage it? Another in, new one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So lots of opportunities for, for you guys into the future. So, you know, having a similar question to what Clayton just said, um, just because I want to bring this up since you, you're so active in our community, um, especially um, with students and mentoring. Um, <clears throat> what is one thing you would like to share with maybe the some of the students that are on uh or listening to this podcast um some kind of perspective or um advice you would give most of your mentors and, and students as they're as they're getting ready to uh, embark into a profession whether it's industry or academia or so on yeah, that, that's great. And and for the for the students that are, you know, in National Association of Plant Breeders, I would say, you know, one of the one of the important things for you to do now in your career is network. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's a great organization to uh, it's it's of a small enough size, around six hundred members, that you can get to know lots of people, uh, and and so get to know them, get to know how people think um what they're thinking about in the future of technologies applied to crop improvement and you know and I, I would say for students don't get don't get locked in on what you think your first job will be or or even all the way to the end of your career what your last job will be so i, I would and, and maybe that ultimately is advice to be flexible to remain flexible in your career path um know what know in general what you want to do and and where your ditches are and what you know what maybe what you don't want to do um but don't get too locked in on your first job i i will say i think the trend in the industry in the private sector right now the number of total field-based plant breeders is not growing and so i i think we need to acknowledge that and accept that's probably the reality um if you want to be a field plant breeder you're going to have to work really hard at it and finding, you know, and some of it's the right job at the right place, the right time. Um, but if you don't, it, your your graduate school effort is not lost or is not 
you know, for not because there, there are a lot of different edges of where you can work around the sides of a direct field plant breeding job if that if that's what your goal is. Um, so don't don't be dismayed over that. Don't get discouraged about you didn't think your first job is shaping up to be uh, all you expected it to be. That that's okay. Don't give up. Keep working at it. Um, find a good place to land. I, I think the the other thing. Um, that's an opportunity is be considering what your choice is on working for a large multinational versus a, a smaller to medium sized company. Um, and here I am and spent the my entire career at large multinationals. OK, so so I'm not going to say that is the only place to land at all. It, it's been great for me. I've had wonderful opportunities through my career. Um, by working at a mul large multinational, but I've also known many people that have worked at small startups mm -hmm. and and the venture capital money is that are the investors that are working on the, the the startups is also a really intriguing place. And and I've known people that have done that and have gone beyond that and done other things too, but that's not a bad place to start either. And or or a bad place to finish. I I have colleagues that are kind of at my point in their career, where they end up at a startup at, at the end of their career, and 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 it's been intriguing to watch some of that materialize too. So I, I'd say just be really flexible, but think about the aspects of large multinationals um, versus small startups, and then also wrestle with public job versus private sector. Yeah. There are benefits to both. Um, you know, there, there are advantages and disadvantages to both. You know, I, I think what we all need to do together, and this is a challenge I would say for all of the students, is we need to do a better job. You guys, for, for your, in the first third of your career, need to do a better job than, than I did and my generation did about public private sector work together in partnerships. We we need each other to be sustainable in this business and continue to make improvements. It it it's there's a place for everyone in either the public sector or private sector. Um, and think about the differences. The, the public sector is obviously obviously the old adage of publish or perish. There's a lot more attention to research projects that end up in in published journal articles. Um, education, of course, is the forefront. You, you may be a combination of a, of a teaching assignment plus a research assignment. Uh, but but don't discount the private sector is not having teaching opportunities because mm -hmm. there's always the education aspect of our, our newer employees that, that, that you, you can always, if you have a teaching spirit about you, there are ways to accomplish that and feel satisfied and rewarded in the private sector as well. Sure. And it's not about a lecture three days a week or five days a week. It's, you know, there are other ways to do that and, yeah. and achieve that outcome. So that's awesome. You made a very good point there overall, Dave, and I really appreciate that. I know as one of your mentees, um, you have some amazing advice. And I think, you know, for me and Clayton, as recent students, we get so bogged down with trying to make sure you complete your dissertation. You know, you go through how many years of hard work right and you you just really want to focus on making sure you get that job at the end of the day and you don't put everything and you don't waste all that time but i think people forget you have a 30 some year career and you can always change you can always adapt and you may not i mean look at you for example you know you started in plant breeding um, and you moved on into other positions and there's so much more out there that i don't think students quite know it, you know, while well, you're still a student and focus on your work, so. Yeah, yeah what, one thing, if you would have told me in 1991 when I was starting my first job, that in, in 2023 and almost to 24 here, that I would be working on advocacy for genome editing mm -hmm. among policy agencies in, in the US and beyond, I, I would have said no way. Like, why would I? Why would I need to do that? Yeah. Right? Is that really going to be a job that you know? I mean, it's not my full time job, but it's it's something I do. And I never would have predicted that that would be in my job description today. 
Um, but it but it's something I firmly believe needs to be done and will will eventually and it's not going to end either. So so that is another twist in a career path. Yeah, I, I met my first graduate student that I ever knew recently last four years that knew that they wanted to go into regulatory affairs sciences and influence policy wow. with regulatory agencies. Probably as a trained up. as a trained plant breeding student, yeah, I, I I never knew anybody that actually had that idea in grad school that that's what they wanted to do, and uh -huh. so yeah, so there's a there's a tremendous number of pathways that you can take. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Dave, we're about at the end of our time here, and as we wrap up with one last question, I want to throw it out there. What is probably one of the most like crazy or fun things that you've got to experience? Like a, a liger, like Oh my gosh, this was probably the highlight of everything I've got to have fun in, in plant breeding. Humorous, or memorable, something that really jumps out that we can just cap this time off with. Yeah, I I, I have to think about um, in my early days, we would go to winter season, winter nurseries every year. Okay. And and all the plant breeders would go and pollinate their corn nurseries. But like, it, it, you know, and so our our families thought we were going off to vacation in January, you know. <laughs> Where with, was Winter Nursery? That's without idea? them, Winter Nursery for me was was Hawaii. Okay. Oh, most wow. of most of the time, so that was a really rough assignment. Everybody thought we were just taking a vacation after the holidays, <laughs> and uh, I I remember when they put in so so we do a lot of different things, but but obviously pollinating together was was I, I mean we were corn breeders, so that was fun. Yeah. Um, but we weren't done at the end of the day. So, you, you know, you'd go to dinner together and you'd have a seaf wonderful seafood dinner and you get to know people deep, deep relationships, you know, with one another, because you're working all the time trying to do the best thing. Um, we're a bunch of young, energetic guys. We were really happy when they put in lights at the tennis courts. <laughs> so there were quite a few of us that would play tennis. So we'd go eat dinner and then we'd go play tennis. Oh, that's awesome. And so anyway, really, really great memories of the early days of, you know, plant breeding. And so a lot of, lot of fun moments. So, so many relationships, just, you know, and more advice to the students is just work work relationships and just you get an opportunity to meet so many people uh, across generations the generations beyond you and 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 below you as well so just work that through your entire career that's awesome well dave thank you so so much for your time here with us today i know lance and i are super grateful for the the mentorship the wisdom the knowledge that you've helped transfer to us over the years and as we continue to move through our careers, I know that you're someone we'll always be able to look back on and say, wow, thank you so much for your time, Dave. Um, so on behalf of everyone who's listening in here, we really appreciate you. Thanks for jumping in with our NAPB Education Committee today and hope that you have a wonderful rest of your career. Thank you so, so much.